Welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. And it's time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. Ondo State Governor Rotimi Akiridulu has described a video that has gone viral giving a quick notice to Igbo people to leave Yoruba land as a senseless and one capable of causing destabilization in the country. This has come at the same time that his Ogun State counterpart, Dakwa Biodun, also dissociated his state from the purported quick notice. In the video, a group uh, that goes by the name Young Yoruba for Freedom called on Igbos residing in the southwest to leave the region. However, both governors, in different statements, resolved to protect the lives and property of not just Igbos, but also those of non yorubas living and working in the southwest of Nigeria. What is happening? Do you know, all this reminds me of is Charles Dickens' <laughs> Tale of Two Cities, the opening mm. paragraph. You know that's, you know, yeah. it's the best of times the and the of worst time. of times. times. The age of wisdom, no. the age of foolishness, foolishness, the epoch of belief, the epoch, epoch of, of disbelief, incredulity, incredulity, the season of. <laughs> yeah? yeah, we don't continue. Yeah. Okay, it reminds me of that. Right now, we're seeing two different forces at play. Yeah. We're seeing the indomitable nature of Nigerians and our kind of attempt to unify after the huge tumult that we witnessed recently. We're seeing the you know, right-minded citizens trying mm. to rally around the most vulnerable, trying to resolve to move on from this stronger mm. and better together. And then we're also seeing this other group on the mm. opposite end of the spectrum who are determined to cause mischief and sow dissent mm. amongst our ranks. And it's completely unacceptable. I want to say it's my urge to ignore or dismiss people like this with their silly videos and their silly ultimatums. But it would be dangerous to do that. It's actually, at a time like this, with the level of volatility that we're seeing, it is worth addressing, which is why these two state governors had to address it. They did the right thing in just not ignoring it. Nothing like this can be ignored, because with the way things are going, the current mobocracy, well, no longer current, thank God, has been mm. brought under control. But last week's mobocracy, anything could happen. This person had the audacity to release a video saying that Abel's would be searched. The uh, cars would be searched, and if anybody who is able is found in the car, this and that would happen. Meaning, who, what state authority would be searching cars? None at, at this point, looking for Igbos. So what that suggests is actually that some kind of parallel security force will be on the street with checkpoints. It's actually extremely disturbing and worth condemning. You can't ignore things like this. Mm. They were right to do that. Well, the best of times, the worst of times. Mm. That's the most apt description of what is happening now. In terms of the best of times, we have seen young people, ordinary Nigerians, the masses, the poor of Nigeria, saying certain things are wrong with Nigeria. And those things that are wrong with Nigeria would need to be corrected, whoever is responsible. Mm. It's not just about Buhari. It's about how the Nigerian state itself is organized. The people are asking for an end to bad governance. They are asking for an end to injustice, inequity. And those fault lines that President Muhammad Buhari identified, but he did not uh, explicate for that in his October 1 address to Nigerians. And Nigerians are saying, collectively, not just the young people, also the older people. After all, we've seen mothers going out onto the streets and saying, look, the reign of impunity in Nigeria must end. But it is also the worst of times because it has shown us certain problems that we have to deal with. Those fault lines that I referred to earlier about ethnicity, about religion. What are we dealing with now in the uh, intro that you read? One character called uh, Adeyinka Grandson, who is based in England, who in 2019, uh, I guess, was arrested or indicted or, you know, uh, uh, reprimanded for promoting terrorism, for promoting hate. He goes online and he says, Igbos must leave Lagos or else, which has become a very popular phrase now in Nigeria, something will happen on Monday, October 26th. What is going to happen? Nothing. Because yesterday, two days ago, Voices of Reason in Yoruba land came forward, the governors, Professor Wale Shuinka, Afeni Ferry, and they said, look, no, it should be ignored. 
In fact, Professor Wallace Inka used the phrase that that message is coming from a sick mind, from a lunatic French. Yes. So who is Ade Inka's grandson for him to speak on behalf of the Yoruba nation, as Afenifere would like to refer to it? So I think it's a statement that should be ignored uh, by Igbo people living in Lagos. Lagos is a cosmopolitan city. Lagos is a melting pot of Nigeria. This is the same Lagos, where a northerner had been minister of Lagos Affairs in the, federal, uh, in the First Republic. This is the same Lagos where uh, Igbo men have been commissioners. Yes. Men are cowboys here and others. This is the same Lagos where Igbos have been uh, members of a parliament representing uh, uh, the, uh, what is it called? Amu Wadofin. Amu Wadofin, uh, Axis, uh, yeah. Ajangbadi, all, all yeah. those areas, you know, uh, and this is also the same Lagos, where an Igbo man, Joe Ibokwe, was spokesman of uh, what you call a Yoruba party for more than 14 years. And his own Igbo people have been saying, oh, he has become a Yoruba man. He's, he has not become a Yoruba man. He's still an Igbo man. Yeah. He's a Nigerian. Yeah. But he's just an Igbo man who plays his politics in Lagos. At the moment, he's the uh, Igbo man in charge of uh, drainage in Lagos. Some people, although uh, derisively say, Joe Igbo Kwe, this is the, his drainage they have given to you. But that's beside the point. The truth of the matter is that Lagos is a microcosm of Nigeria. Yes. It's not a place where one uh, grandson what kind of name is Imunda? Imagine, exactly. Who does come up and say Igbos must leave Lagos? Igbos are not leaving Lagos. We are all here together. Yeah. And I guess he's saying that because, you know, this strain is perpetually there. Uh, but in Lagos, uh, you know, it's a melting pot, as I said earlier. However, the ethnic dimension of this uh, NSAS, which has become politicized heavily, you will recall that there's also a video that has been going around in which uh, Namde Kanu of IPOP uh, reportedly advised Igbos in Lagos to attack Yoruba interests. Now, the uh, Lagos state government has condemned that. There have been all kinds of uh, statements about fake news, you know, but what we need to say is that everybody that is involved should stay away from ethnicity and religious politics, yeah. because that is not what this hashtag answers uh, protest is all about. That was never the original intention of the young people of Nigeria who went in that direction, and SARS, and in security now. The feminist coalition over the weekend issued a very enlightened statement, which was even better than the statement that was issued by the president of Nigeria. And what they're saying is about how to move Nigeria forward. I think any effort by anybody, any party, any group, any uh, so-called leader of any movement, whether it's a grandson or a grandparent trying to destroy Nigeria with ethnic and religious sentiments, should be deplored, should be condemned, should be rejected. And I would like to commend our Fenny Ferry, Professor Wale Shinka, the Lagos State Government, uh, governors in the Southwest region, who have all come forward to say, no, this is not Igbo versus uh, Yoruba. It's this not. is not Yoruba versus Fulani. This is about the soul of Nigeria. And it is about a discussion around how we can save Nigeria. It's always so and, sad. And People who claim to be educated resorting to that kind of... And which is very, I mean, I'm not, but I'm not surprised. Like uh, Wale Shinka said in the statement released over the weekend, he talked about identity theft. You know? Yeah, he released two statements. two statements. That was the first one. The, the first second one. one was about he, this he attempt. He talked to... about identity theft, the proliferation of fake news, and how some people have tried to peddle the lines of, you know, the things that divide us. But for people like that, please, I've got, I've got word for you. Nigeria is greater than any one man, and United will stand, please. Friday and Saturday of last week saw total devastation in Nigeria's Cross River State, where hoodlums went on a rampage and attacked several property belonging to politicians and serving and retired. Houses and cars and business interests of the targets were not spared during the orgy of violence. Warehouses were also broken into where food items meant to serve as COVID-19 palliatives were stored. The state governor, Ben Ayade, reacted to this development. To bring to the attention of Cross Riverians that we're enforcing a 24-hour curfew every day 
until we see that there's improvement in the security situation. Let me once more thank the majority of Crossoverians who have predominantly obeyed the curfew. The curfew became necessary occasion by the massive looting by people that I believe have a very little clue of the cumulative implication of their action. We spend all our day throughout the night, no sleep. We have to secure this territory because coming to this territory, they are going to do a lot of harm to this territory because we know most of the big men are staying here, like the governor's house is here, Dansuki house is here, and all the rest of them. You can see this bishop house. So all throughout the night, we could not sleep. We were here awake. I think the whole lungs have hijacked the protests, and as you can see, the state treasure is, uh, is no longer safe. So that's why we, the youth of this area, were coming out to do our best to make sure that we secure what we have. So far, so good. It's been good. We've not been, they've been vigilant since yesterday, and uh, they're still on guard to forestall anything that uh, anybody's trying to do in this area. All right, uh, this is another story, and I can say for free, this happened all over the country. It really did. Almost everywhere. Things were looted. I mean, you ask, how did we get here? It was just the most shocking rampage, but we know how we got here. We know exactly how we got here. Just the negligence on the part of the government, federal and state, because we have to also address the fact that the criminal activity that was targeted against hardworking Nigerians is completely unacceptable. But on the other hand, we saw looting of warehouses with COVID-19 palliatives that were meant to be distributed to the people during the lockdown. That did not happen. Who, what kind of mind decides to hoard palliatives that were meant for the poorest and the most vulnerable among us. What kind of grasping avarice is that? When those warehouses were broken into, I was completely disgusted. So I'd like to separate those two. Looting is always a criminal act, but I do separate those two in my mind at least. The attacks on fellow hardworking Nigerians and their businesses and livelihoods is one thing. The looting is actually the people taking what belongs to them. It should never have been hoarded in the first case. But Cross River State had... There was a list of 52 different properties that were vandalized, destroyed, looted. It's staggering. I just want to know where were the security agencies at that time that such a rampage, and it seemed really coordinated, such a coordinated rampage could have occurred without any impediment. 52 properties. Just like that. Yes, well, um, Calabar is of special interest with me, uh, for me, having grown up there um, at a time in my life. And, I mean, 52 locations, as Tundum pointed out, including the homes of politicians, properties belonging to private persons who are not even connected with government. Uh, what we have seen here is an extension of the protest. The argument that uh, the protest has been hijacked was clearly proven in Calabar because there was also an attack on the neuropsychiatric hospital. Oh. At the neuropsychiatric hospital, uh, you know, persons receiving mental health treatment were freed, beds were stolen, and then you will be wondering why the attack on a neuropsychiatric uh, hospital. hospital. Malls, supermarkets were also attacked, warehouses were also attacked. And then, of course, you had a special focus on politicians. The home of uh, Senator Geshon Bassi uh, was attacked. In his uh, family house, there was somebody who was even saying, oh, uh, take whatever you can take, but uh, don't set the house on fire because of uh, neighboring houses. The home of Senator Victor Nduma Egba was also uh, set ablaze. And these are persons that did not have COVID-19 palliatives in their homes. Uh, supermarkets, Valumat, uh, Calabar shopping mall, you know, the whole city went up in flames, literally. Now, what does this signify? But it is not only uh, Calabar. In uh, Taraba, we have reports of people also attacking, you know, politicians' homes and also uh, palliatives' uh, warehouses. In uh, Lagos here, in Ikurudu, uh, the home of uh, the majority leader, of the House of Assembly was also attacked. He said he was keeping the palliatives for his uh, birthday 
uh, for him to distribute them. In Ibadan, Senator Teslim Folani's house was also attacked, uh, where they carted away uh, refrigerators, about 300 motorcycles. Senator Teslim Folani says those, um, you know, uh, materials were being kept for the empowerment of the people. Here in Lagos, uh, a COVID-19 uh, warehouse uh, mm -hmm. it was also attacked. Not one, not two. But the Lagos State government says those palliatives in those warehouses do, do not necessarily belong to the Lagos State government, that they belong to the uh, private sector coalition known as CACOVID, which in September, specifically on September 22, provided these materials to be distributed. And those materials have not been distributed up to now. In Elori, the explanation in Kwara State, where a COVID-19 palliative warehouse was also uh, attacked. The explanation is that the government was waiting for the federal government uh, to commission those palliatives before they will be distributed in the last one month. So you have two sides to it. Warehouses being attacked. The argument from civil society is that, well, you cannot blame anybody for attacking those warehouses because the people merely took what belongs to them and that government has no right to keep those materials, bags of rice, sacks of uh, gari, uh, packs of uh, indomie and noodles and whatever in those warehouses without giving the people. But the question is, how about logistics? Suppose these states have not worked out the logistics. But the question you ask is, okay, for a whole month, you will keep these palliatives, the people will be hungry. I don't buy that. After, after Nigerians have protested that uh, the Minister of uh, Humanitarian Disaster and uh, social development, uh, Shadia Uma Farouk, mm. I think that's her name. Yeah, uh, she had been accused of not distributing palliatives. People had said they were not seeing the palliatives. Only to find these palliatives sitting in warehouses from Jos to Ilori to uh, Benin. Every part of the country. So the people, the argument is that, okay, they freed what belongs to them. And we have been told not to call them hoodlums, not to call them looters. Okay, that's a, the political side of it. But how about the private persons, the people on Admiralty Way, whose properties were attacked, mm. whose supermarkets were attacked, the people in Edo, the people in uh, Adeni Rogunsonya, Bode Thomas, people innocent people, people, people so who disgusting. borrowed money, people at uh, Sekumo, at uh, Jakonde in Lagos, whose businesses were attacked, their things were carted away, Valumat in uh, Calabar, and in other parts of the uh, country. Now, that side of it just tells you that we're dealing with anarchy, with chaos, with implications of poverty. If you don't take care of your people, they, I, the other day on this program, I asked a question about collective psychogenic crisis. The whole country has gone mad. Yeah. There is a mental health crisis that is collective and national. You can say that again. And, right. and, and can, that is why you, you can governance is required, yeah. leadership is required. And when our leaders tell stories, they talk about fake news, fake news. OK, will anybody say the looting of warehouses is fake news? Will anybody say the attack on private persons' assets is fake news? Now, who is going to provide restitution for those private persons? Mm. Innocent persons, for the most part, you know, well, you can say the politicians, you don't care about them. But how about private Everyday persons Nigerians. who like have Nigeria. lost so much? It's yeah. completely unacceptable. And Dr. Abati, plus what you said, I want to top this by saying a lot of people are becoming psychogenic, plus the proliferation of the use of drugs among young people. Well, Indian hemp. Proof on that, you know. Indian hemp. Dr. Abati, mm. go to the streets. Indian hemp, codeine. Tramadol. So they weren't in their right senses when they were doing all these. Uh, a things. lot Tundu of five. them. You seem to know all the. Uh, a lot of them are on all drugs. the assets. Tundo, we have a drug problem in this country. Nobody's addressing. It is shocking. Yeah, but something is wrong mentally <laughs> with our country. We have a big drug problem in this country. Well, that, that's all. We'll take on news headlines. We'll take a short break now. We'll return. I have the duo of Rotus uh, and, and this one more to give us updates on Africa and COVID nineteen. Stay with us. All right, welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rising Channel. Uh, Rotus Adiri, how are you? Good morning. Great to talk to you, Rotus. 
Hello, Rutus. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor, and good morning, Tundu. Uh, so, look, we begin, of course, with a notice from the Lagos State Government with respect to the uh, curfew and the restriction of movements. There was a tweet that was sent out, which is going to, of course, affect commuters, affect businesses, and regulate pretty much everyone's movement. So, curfew update. The curfew in Lagos State has been reviewed. Restriction time is now 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., meaning that from after 6 a.m. up until 7.59, folks can move around. That was a little bit confusing for a few people. Lagosians are enjoined to plan their journey times as they go about their lawful businesses. All public and private schools remain shut until further notice. So the disruptions to education, I have to say, have, have continued all through 2020, and it's been tough for those who do not have access to online uh, facilities to be able to continue their education. Um, just to set the scene here, we're in a rebuilding stage and we're focusing on the, on the hits that banks have taken uh, in the country due to the violence that has spilled over from what occurred at the Lucky Target. Um, we're looking at, in, uh, we did some investigations here and we estimated what was, based on our investigations and the banks that we spoke to, what kind of uh, damage they faced. So we look here, First Bank, for instance, it's estimated that about 10 of their locations were uh, affected, uh, three in uh, Aba. Uh, one in uh, Umahia, which of course is in uh, an area, local government area in uh, Abia State. Uh, Enugu had one, uh, one area which was damaged, one branch that was damaged. Uh, Ikot Ekwene, uh, which is in uh, local government area in Akwai Bomb. One, area, one branch that was affected, Lagos, four of them. Union Bank, uh, our estimates are we had about 10 branches that were uh, affected. We still haven't quite um, sorted out the locations, but based on the preliminary investigations we did, about 10 of them were affected. GTB, nine. I haven't got listed all nine, but we all know, of course, the Admiralty branch that was severely burned. Going to be there later on today uh, to take a look at the repairs that are going on, because some of the banks have actually started uh, repairs on some of these uh, branches. Access Bank also suffered some damage, about eight estimated, five in Lagos, one in Abao, one Calabar, one Uyo. Uh, we move on to more uh, branches, more banks uh, across the country. Stambik IBTC, uh, an estimate of two of them in Lagos that were damaged. Harris's Bank, uh, one of them in Lagos. Echo Bank, one estimated branch that suffered damage in Benin. And then Polaris Bank, uh, which was really, really, really damaged. I think we have video of that uh, in uh, Lagos State. So, of course, you know, we move on now. There's some videos that we, that we took. That were, look, this is the entrance to the, uh, ad the Admiralty going into Lucky Phase 1. Zenith Bank donated this watchtower. You can see uh, the damage that was that was uh, that, that you know, the building suffered. Also, uh, further in the, the Zenith Bank, while well, I was still with Zenith Bank, their ATM. They've already actually start, started uh, repairs. If we look at the uh, ATM, the so this is remember the drone footage we had. There was the drone footage we had. We sh we saw men who were at this location that were working on trying to rebuild this. So they've already boarded up uh, this particular area. They've boarded up the ATM. This was an ATM set about four or five of them that were there that suffered heavy damage in the af aftermath of the, um, of the violence. So they have already, they've boarded it up and it looks like repairs are going to begin. Uh, Stambig IBTC, um, this was one of their ATMs also on, on Admiralty that suffered some, some serious damage. And remember, these monitors, they're not manufactured here in Nigeria, right? So I mean, a number of them are, are imported. So if, as we zoom in closer here, you will see the extent to which the glass was shattered and the ATMs were, were completely, you can see the big hole inside the, uh, the ATMs there. Um, that's, that's at uh, the uh, Stambik IBTC. In fact, one of their branches was also suffered damage as well, in addition to this ATM. This is an off-site ATM. Um, who else? A access Bank. Uh, this is repairs. You can see repairs already beginning at the Access Bank. This is all on Admiralty, by the way, just to, to, to again, for our viewers. This is all on Admiralty Way in Lekki Phase 1. You can see they've already set up scaffolding. Um, with, you can see the glass and the amount of damage that this, uh, the Access Bank location suffered um, on Admiralty. You can see the ATMs. You can see all the the shattered glass on the on the floor the ATMs also as well were severely damaged and but work has begun and the reason why work has begun so quickly is that for in fact I know GTB access a Union Bank Zenith all the banks that have begun the to their repairs 
these are critical locations. You can, okay, this is GCB now. You can see, again, this was the drone footage captured this from above. But this is zooming in now. You can see the amount of damage from the fire on the right-hand side um, of the building, the extent to which the flames engulfed the side of the building. Again, this is still a GTB branch on uh, Admiralty. Uh, they've already started uh, repairs. Um, they already got um, uh, repairmen who are already on sites that have started repairing some of the damage. There was extensive damage, not just on the side of the building. I think we've got more footage of, of the gentlemen, the f f folks that are there now, who are actually now working to restore uh, the damage at that uh, uh, GTB uh, location. So it's, 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 it's pretty widespread when you think about the amount of damage um, that's there. Again, we're going to be there later on today, you know, taking, taking stock of what's occurred. But there are critical branches that are, you know, for these banks, they have to start repairs very quickly because this part of this part of um, Admiralty Way is not only a commercial area, it's also a residential area. So there's bars, there's restaurants, there's uh, schools, there's all these people need money. So now when you think about it, with the amount of damage that's been done to ATMs, where are people now going to get access um, to cash? I think that the POS operators, the individuals who give cash back services where you pay a fee and they take your card and then give you cash back, they are probably the ones, I've seen them popping up here and there, they will be the ones to benefit from this lack of access um, uh, to cash for a lot of people in that area. And again, if you look at that, the, the, the estimates that we have, this is not just in Lagos. This is you know, across different parts of, uh, of the country. But the banks have to quickly begin rebuilding. They have to quickly begin um, um, damage repair because these are such critical, critical branches to their operations. So it's something we'll be looking at through today. And that's what's been dominating coverage now is how businesses are going to um, respond to this. It's not just banks. We're going to be looking at SMEs later on this week and a number of other in, uh, in industries as well. Excellent focus. Uh, this is just an indication of how uh, the crisis that Nigeria faces has affected different uh, economies, uh, different parts of the economy. Uh, previously, we talked about private assets being uh, attacked. Now you are focusing on the banking sector. The examples you have shown will probably be the civilized ones. In some other parts of Lagos, far away from Lekki, Admiralty Way, look, those uh, ATM machines were uprooted. They were taken out. And the question is, what do we learn from that? What does this tell us? Are we dealing with poverty, you know, that has zoomed a ferocious, a furious dimension and pushed the people to another level? Because definitely anybody who uproots an ATM machine is looking for money. Second, are there precautions that the banks can take beyond just the repairs that you have shown. What kind of uh, precautions can they take to protect their ATM machines? Because there's no guarantee that another day uh, those ATM machines will not be targeted. Third, uh, what, can we measure the extent of the damage? Has any bank come forward to say, well, from the attack on our uh, machines, uh, some banks were even uh, opened up and violated uh, what is the measurement of the extent of the uh, damage? And four, in any case, I mean, uh, is this a big deal for the banks? The banks seem to have been the only ones uh, doing well from uh, what we have seen with uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh, uh, reports and, and also in terms of performance uh, in the stock market. And in any case, the banks will be uh, insured. These are some of the questions I would like you to address. Questions, uh, Doctor. So, as far as security, if in fact, when we were uh, we were out there yesterday taking some of this footage, there was actually heavy military presence at the front of the um, of the entrance to Admiralty. So. That, of course, is coming from the states, though. So the state has deployed key military um, uh, military um, uh, points at different parts of the state. So that's serving as security for now. But I think that's in line with the curfew, as you saw the, the tweet from Lagos State Government with the restrictions for the curfew. So we haven't seen any particular banks beef up security for now. The banks are focused right now on repairing their branches so that customers can return. And remember, this is another key thing. Before this even happened, due to the pandemic, um, the banks were already tell, you know, rotating operations between their branches. So even here on Awolowo Road, one of the banks that has more than one location on here where we are, 
they were rotating branches already, so not all branches were operational. Now you layer that, you layer the, uh, the violence, the effects of the violence on existing branches. That now puts pressure on the branches they were already rotating. So security right now is coming from federal government on the military and then you know police from the uh, police as well. We haven't seen any individual branches now beef up security. I think what they want to do first is to fix the branches, repair them, and then they now talk about security. As far as damage in our investigations, we haven't got any estimates yet. The banks will be submitting their insurance claims to the insurance companies. We tried to get to talk to some of the insurance. Some of the insurance, they cover the ATMs, they cover the physical branches, they cover different part. So we've been told that all the damage you're seeing here, they will submit their claims to them. We won't see this until Q, uh, Q4, we're rather we're in the fourth quarter of the year. So until ne early next year when the banks submit their financials. Right now we're in getting Q3 financials from the different institutions. But until early next year, we won't actually see the extent to the damage. It'll, it'll, you know, it's going to affect their financials. I think they have to dip into their retained earnings in order to try to, to, uh, um, uh, you know, you know, to get this going. And then they are now hopefully reimbursed by the insurance uh, claim, the insurance um, uh, policies that they have. So we, we also, in our investigation, we talked to some insurance companies. They said that, well, look, um, as of right now, the banks have to submit the claims to them. So all this damage repair you're seeing, they take the estimates of that, put all that in, into context, send it over to the insurance. So it will be later on that we get um, uh, estimates. But look, I mean, even Rufai yourself, Dr. Tundu, you, 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 you mused on this um, last week when we were looking at damage. It's going to be in the billions. I mean, when you put everything, total everything up. I can't really segment for banks right now, but for the kind of damage that we've seen, it's, it's, going, to be, um, it's going to be quite heavy. What happens going forward, the doctor, as you've said, good question. Do you beef up your security? What, when we talk about high interest rates in Nigeria, these are the kind of things that feed into the double-digit interest rates you see when you try to get a loan from a bank. Cost of doing business, the generators, maintenance of branches, now you see security and risk. Whatever beefing up they do, it's going to filter down to you and I, the end users at the end of the day. Rotus, you'll recall that right at the beginning of this um, pandemic, there was a huge storm about banks using that opportunity to lay off staff. Those concerns were assuaged to a certain degree. Are we looking at that again? Has that scenario re-arisen at this point? Right, okay, great question, Tundu. The central bank, of course, has been very clear on them getting approval before any layoffs take place. So the central bank has done its best to protect the employees of these banks and to try to stem any um, layoffs. But it's a great question because that was before this violence. We've seen the estimates across the country. It's going to come at a cost. It's going to put pressure on the branches that have been damaged, which are already, I mean, if I can use the term, being rationed as far as operations are concerned. So that does come up again. But I believe that the central bank will just pretty much repeat what it did in the wake of the pandemic. It's saying, hey, look, banks, just you know, take it easy on layoffs at this time. Um, probably not. They will need to get approval, essentially. Approval will need to be get. So they, they will try to stem the tide. But it's a valid question. In that that can rear its head again because all these damages they, they the costs pile up and these are costs that are already on top of their balance sheets and their you know income statements operations are reduced less people going out so you know it's, it's something that has to be definitely looked at again and could come up again quickly let me piggyback on the, the question raised by uh, Tundo. do you see any connection uh, between the attack on the banks and what happened when the uh, feminist coalition was trying to raise funds, and uh, they were stopped uh, by the banks, and the feminist coalition had to uh, look for bitcoins. Could, this, could there be a connection in terms of the anger against the banks? I doubt. Good question, doctor, but I, I doubt. I mean, what, where we already saw before that, uh, the increase, the spike in bitcoin use, before the violence occurred, we are, we, we are here on the, on the Global Business Report, even here on the morning show, we, talk, we had that, um, that summary, that Bitcoin summary, where you saw spikes in South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria. That was, of course, due to the FX um, liquidity issues that were, that were already apparent in the country. Traders here in... Remember, the central bank... Struck, Nigeria struck a deal with uh, uh, China. There was the Naira Huan swap, where traders here could get access to Huan for them to bring in products from China, which they could now sell here. So the bank has already, Nigeria is already trying to address that issue. The FX liquidity issues now forced some traders 
to deal in Bitcoin to pay suppliers overseas to bring their products here. So that was already up there. So the Feminist Coalition, when that happened with them and their uh, Flutterwave account, I believe it was, when they lost access to that, they just moved to Bitcoin and that was just a, a continuing trend. I kind of doubt if there'll be a connection between that and um, the destruction we've seen. As you already alluded to, people trying to uproot ATMs, I think that's just a situation with poverty, anger, frustration, just trying to get access to funds. So I wouldn't uh, draw a line between the two. Very spot on, Rose, because uh, we, there was an, sort of like an ecosystem, you know, for cryptocurrencies generally in the country before now, and, and they also used other means. And uh, uh, just for the sake of knowledge, Zimbabwe, I think Zimbabwe has about one of the biggest cryptocurrencies ecosystem because we know what have happened to their currency over the years in Zimbabwe. So, so that definitely just latches on what is happening. But thank you so much for your insight, Rotus. Really, really appreciate you for that. Uh, we get some updates on COVID-19 pandemic. Adesua Moro. Okay, we'll go for a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk to Adesua about what is happening uh, based on COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be right back. All right, uh, for more updates on COVID-19, Adesua Mara joins us. Adesua, what is happening? Uh, we seem to be having a curfew too in Europe. There's curfew, 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 curfew everywhere in the world. COVID-19 curfew, riot curfew, what's happening? Indeed, uh, Rufai. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Bati, and good morning, Tundu. Uh, Europe is seeing the nightmare we witnessed at the beginning of the pandemic. Over 9 million people have now uh, contracted the coronavirus on the continent. So a lot of attention, a lot of measures, including lockdowns, restrictions, but a bit more targeted, unlike the blanket ones we saw. But Rufai, as it is uh, the tradition, let's quickly take a look at the global numbers this morning. As the coronavirus continues to spread across the world. Uh, over 43 million people have now been infected and in excess of 1 million deaths. Uh, let us also say that several millions have recovered from this virus. The virus is surging in many regions and some countries that you know, had apparent success in suppressing it uh, in initial outbreaks are now having second wave, third wave surges or spikes. Away from that, now, uh, as those numbers continue to soar, the head of the World Health Organization is for the umpteenth time calling for global solidarity in the rollout of any future corona vaccine uh, that we have. In a video address at the opening of a three-day World Health Summit in Berlin, uh, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus said that the only way to recover from the pandemic was together and by making sure poorer countries had fair access to a vaccine. Now, Dr. Tredros believes that uh, the effective way to control the virus when a vaccine is eventually available is to vaccinate, listen to this, some people in all countries rather than all people in some countries. And that makes a lot of sense. He says vaccine nationalism will only prolong the pandemic and will never shorten it. Now, scientists around the world are racing to develop a vaccine like we've never seen before. Uh, but uh, the European Union, the US, B uh, Britain, Japan, and a slew of other countries have placed large orders with these companies involved in developing the most uh, promising vaccines. And concerns are growing that countries with smaller wallets, smaller pockets, could be left out, you know, at the back of the queue. You recall that the WHO launched an international scheme known as the COVAX to help ensure that everybody gets equitable access to jabs. But the U.S., you know, you would recall also that the Trump administration refused to join the international effort of COVAX, but instead is pursuing its own unilateral vaccine program called Operation uh, WAP Speed. I'm still talking about uh, vaccines. Let's go to Israel. This sounds promising. Uh, Israel will begin its first clinical trials of vaccine next month. Authorities revealed this yesterday. The first clinical trials of the, it's called the Brylife vaccine, will begin on November 1. And uh, according to the spokesperson for the Defense Ministry, he said that the necessary approvals have been given and the trials will, will be conducted over several months. Now, this, the first stage will conduct a preliminary safety trials on 80 healthy volunteers between the ages of 18 and 55. That number is expected to grow in the second phase to 960 volunteers. And in the third stage, it will be broader uh, to examine vaccine effectiveness with up to 30,000 volunteers. Israel is grappling with a second wave of the infections. 
uh, COVID has killed 2,317 people in the Jewish state since the start of the outbreak there, and 300,000 people have been infected according to official figures. Uh, let's go to the U.S. The coronavirus doesn't seem to have left the White House. Uh, the chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence and four others in the vice president's inner circles have tested positive. And despite this, the vice president continues his aggressive campaign eight days to the U.S. elections. And according to the CDC protocols, the vice president should actually be quarantined and he should be wearing face masks. But we're not seeing a lot of that from the vice president. And this is doubly awkward because the vice president leads the coronavirus task force for the Trump administration. So it's a question of are you leading by example in the U.S.? Um, and that's it, guys. Uh, obviously, you asked the question, and this one, so, question sounds sort of very rhetorical to me anyway, because he, obviously he's not leading by example. Mike Pence has never shown leadership. Donald Trump either has never shown leadership since all of this started. And it's just eight days to the elections. I just pray he doesn't come down with this. Concerning the lockdown across Europe, uh, it got bigger over the weekend. But there are some group of scientists, and they're talking about something called the Great Barrington Plan, which a lot of people have rebuffed. What they're saying invariably is, let's use herd mentality to fight this. Let's have, you know, special care for people that are vulnerable in society and let other people move around their daily duties. But the consensus across the science world is we're fighting it back. If you go to South America, Colombia became another country with over one million cases. So most countries now are beginning to hit the one million target. And this throws a big question that how are they getting those numbers on time? Is it that they're having fresh infections or a lot of people are getting reinfected that we do not know. This is another concern I want us to talk about. Uh, that's still going on in England. That's still going on in most parts of France. But, but I want you to, to prevail on that concern. Is it that it, these are infections or people are getting fresh infections? Well, before you come in, um, Adesua, first, in the United States, I think that the uh, vice president, Mike Pence, is grossly negligent. He's showing a very bad example. Uh, he was tested on Sunday, and we were told that uh, he tested negative. But, you know, the uh, scientists have said, even when you are tested within a short space of time, uh, then it doesn't mean that you are COVID-19 free. And the person who made that point is a scientist called Dr. Ali Nouri. So what uh, Vice President uh, Mike Pence is doing is that he's putting the lives of people who will come close to him uh, uh, into jeopardy because he could still spread the virus. But his spokesperson and also uh, Meadows, the chief of staff of the White House, insist that he's an essential worker. Now, and they are quoting the Center for Disease Control and saying that the Center for Disease Control says if you are an essential worker, uh, then of course you can go about your essential duties. I don't know how he's an essential duty worker. What we're seeing is the desperation on the part of the uh, uh, Trump-Pence campaign to see how they can close the gap, the yawning gap that will make them lose the election uh, on November 3. So just, it looks like an African situation, whereby our leaders say, oh, do as we tell you, but don't do as we do. And I think it's very unfortunate that the country with the highest prevalence of COVID-19 is a place where leadership is so short. Because what Mike Pence is doing, essentially, is that he's following the example of his boss, uh, President Donald Trump, whose response also to COVID-19 has been thoroughly cavalier uh, throughout uh, the year. As for Spain, yes, in Spain, there is a very desperate situation. At a time in Europe, Spain in the Northern Hemisphere had the uh, highest numbers. Now, the restrictions that they are trying to impose is consistent with what is going on across the entire northern uh, hemisphere, whether it's in Italy or it's in Spain or it's in France or it's in uh, the UK, Belgium, Poland, Greece, everywhere. And in Spain in, particularly, in particular, over the weekend, the numbers rose from about 45,000 cases on Saturday to 52,000 cases by Sunday morning. And so these restrictions uh, need to be uh, uh, imposed, as it were. Now, as for vaccine nationalism, 
I think that uh, the Director General of the WHO is absolutely right. He has always been talking about global solidarity. And we have in place what they call the COVAS Alliance. That COVAS Alliance is supposed to ensure equity, to make sure that even poor countries have access to the vaccine. And that's the whole point that uh, Dr. Gabriel Jesus was making at a three-day World Health Summit that took place over the weekend uh, in Berlin. And I think it is important that every country looks out for the other country. Uh, because, you know, of course, take a country like Nigeria or other countries in uh, Africa. We have signed up, along with 158 other countries, uh, to that COVAS alliance. I think that the interest of the poor, the underprivileged, uh, the low- and middle-income countries also needs to be protected. So in that regard, preaching about global solidarity as opposed to vaccine nationalism, I think is very important. I mean, in Israel, in Israel, now, my big takeaway in Israel is that you will see that this vaccine trial, three-state trial that has now been initiated, is a combination of efforts on the part of the Institute for Biological Research, the Ministry of Defense, and the Ministry of Health. And I would like to stress the point about the Ministry of Defense. In other countries, as we have also seen in Russia, the military, they help to move society forward. They are part of progressive causes in society. Uh, I, I would like to see someday when the Nigerian military is part of finding a solution to the problems that confront the people in real time. But here in Nigeria, as we see in Russia, as we see in uh, Israel, with the defense ministry helping the people, the defense ministry in Nigeria is being accused of turning the guns on the uh, people who purchased those guns and who made it possible for an institution like the military to exist. Uh, right. In that regard, okay. Israel is different from Nigeria, but <laughs> like Nigeria, Israel has had weeks now of anti-Netanyahu protests about the botched COVID response, about corruption and bad governance. So maybe this might help assuage some of those feelings and people might go back home because all they're doing apparently well, if you um, Israel's press is to be believed is spreading the virus these are the major cities Tel Aviv Jerusalem Haifa people have come out in their thousands over the past two weeks or so so let's see if this you know gives them any satisfaction with regards to Mike Pence it has to be stressed that he's actually the head of America's COVID-19 task force not Donald Trump so it goes to show what a disaster that whole response has been. He has not taken his leadership seriously. He seems to have bowed to the dictates of his principle, as Dr. Abati said, which he really ought not to have done, because there's a reason why he was vice president. We all have to know, and this is something that we see here in Nigeria as well, the vice president or deputy on a ticket is not just an appendage. They are there to bring value. They are there to contribute positively. And Mike Pence has utterly failed in that regard. Right. And so the question I asked earlier on, I just want to know your take on it. Are these new infections or... These are repeat infections. Uh, Rufa, a lot of things we are dealing with here. There's been negligence, there's been uh, pandemic fatigue, but it, there's also a path that we have forgotten. So a lot of countries are now imposing lockdowns, state of emergency, restrictions, but there's a first part to breaking the chain of transmission, which is, which is track and trace, and then test. So what scientists are saying is that a lot of countries are sort of abandoning that part of the response to the pandemic where you are where you ought to track you trace and then test so what we are saying is those are not being done the infections as you know the incubation period so these numbers are rising because we have failed to track trace and test we're just imposing lockdowns. Uh, I think that's what we are majorly saying. There are not necessarily new infections in some places. In some places, we're seeing new infections, but in other places, it's just infections that have, that have missed, you know, the horse has bolted, and we're just uh, picking them up now because we did not track, we did not trace, and we're not testing enough. All right, very, very well said, Azizu Amaro. I really appreciate you for that.